Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for today's program. Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site presents Olmsted's Life and Legacy. We're going to enjoy a virtual lunchtime lecture. Uh, while the world knows him today as the foremost American landscape architect, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted would live a full life well before designing open green spaces. From a childhood uh, in New England, Olmsted went on to practice farming, journalism, administration, and a number of other professions. Despite trying on many hats, everything Olmsted did in his life prepared him to become a landscape architect. We're going to examine Olmsted's life from his early years up until his final days. And this, present, this program is presented by Isabel Schulman, who's the Community and Youth Engagement Coordinator at the Frederick Law Olmsted National Historic Site. So all 335 of us watching live, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Isabel for joining us this afternoon. And Isabel, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you for that introduction, Robert. Like Robert said, I'm Isabel Schulman, Community and Youth Engagement Coordinator here at Fair Said at 99 Warren Street in Brookline, where I'm standing now in one of Olmsted's two bedrooms. He had a summer bedroom and a winter bedroom. And so now we're going to talk about Frederick Law Olmsted's life and legacy from his birth all the way up until his death. So did my slide change? Uh, not yet. Give, not it yet. A, give it another shot. Okay. I'm just going to exit out and reopen it because I think that will be better. There we go. So Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. There's going to be a lot of Fredericks and a lot of Johns in this story, so I'll try and refer to them as best I can. But Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. was born in Hartford, Connecticut on April 26, 1822 to a loving family. Um, I only have a picture of his father here because unfortunately, Frederick Law Olmsted's mother would die when he was around the age of three he would actually witness the death of his mother, but he really had a very strong relationship with his father, John, who you see in the picture uh, with the family dog, Neptune, sitting by his feet. John was an incredibly loving father and also had a bit of an advantage. As a founding family of Hartford, Connecticut, the Olmsteads were a very wealthy family. John owned a dry goods store, so while many children at the time, you know, didn't always get the chance to go to school, John really pushed his children into schooling. They really, he really wanted to instill a strong sense of education in them, but he also wanted to instill this love of nature, this love of being outside. There are countless stories of John taking his two sons, Frederick and John Hull Olmsted, out into the Connecticut countryside. They went hiking up to New Hampshire where uh, when Olmsted saw the man in the mountain, he was a little unimpressed thinking that perhaps someone had done that purposefully. They went on a trip to Niagara Falls before Olmsted would get the opportunity to work on it, which we'll touch on later. And so John really instilled this sense of independence in his two sons. There are countless stories of uh, John and Frederick going off at the ages of around six and four, crossing the state of Connecticut all on their own, staying at tavern houses when they left. So not exactly what you do in 2023, but at the time it was accepted and his father really wanted to push that sense of independence. Now, because Olmsted, perhaps because of that early death of his mother, his father really wanted to instill a love of school. So he sent him out of the house for his schooling days. Um, unfortunately, this wouldn't be very successful for Olmsted as he went to a number of uh, religious ministers, priests, pastors, all of whom were slightly abusive to him. And it kind of gave him this lifelong disdain for organized religion. Really nature became the love of his life and kind of in a, in a way his chapel. And so when Frederick Law Olmsted is around 13 years old, as he is loving to be outside, loving exploring, touching every possible plant he can, he unfortunately goes and he touches poison sumac and he then touches his eyes. And so he would lose vision for about three months. He would gain it back, but his father kind of felt like you're always going to be playing catch up in school. Let's just pull you out, which is incredibly unfortunate because he is this lifelong learner. So he really resorts to books to teach him as much as he can. He begins reading Ruskin and all these kind of environmental ideals, particularly from England. And when his older brother, John, enrolls at Yale University, um, we wouldn't have called it auditing then, but that's what Olmsted did. He sat in on classes because he never stopped loving learning. 
So he kind of, he would end up actually getting an honorary degree from Yale, but he would really sit in on as many classes as he can with his brother. And some of his favorite classes to sit in on was engineering, which kind of will play into his later career. Um, so while he's at Yale, uh, he befriends John's close uh, college dorm, dorm mate, uh, Charles Loring Brace. And Charles Loring Brace and John are planning this trip to England. Oh, wait, I should preface that. Excuse me. Before I say the trip to England, I will say that before Olmsted goes to England, um, he really does want to leave the country. He wants to kind of find what is my career going to be? I've been taken out of school, but I still want to do something. What can I do? And so Olmsted comes from this long line of New England seafarers. So he thinks that perhaps that's my next career. So in 1843, he signs up for this voyage to China and he's got all these dreams of immersing himself in the culture meeting all these new people. He's got letters of introductions for professors studying in China. And the trip over is a complete nightmare. The captain is horribly abusive. He gets to China, they get about 20, 30 feet off the boat, unloads the hull, gets back on the boat across to America again. So really not a successful trip. In fact, when he arrived back in New York City, uh, his father didn't recognize him because he had lost so much weight on the voyage. And so Olmsted, you know, he now has this sense of travel in him. He wants to see the world because he didn't really get the opportunity in China. And John Hull, his brother, and Charles Loring Brace, his, room, his college roommate, they are discussing this trip to China. And Olmsted gets, or excuse me, this trip to England. And Olmsted gets very jealous because he has never left the country, not really counting the China trip. And he also is thinking that his next career is going to be as a farmer his father has already purchased him a farm on Staten Island, which he is hoping to cultivate. It's not really going as well as he thought. So he decides to convince his father, a very loving father who hardly ever said no to his sons, that you should send me to England because at this point in time, there are no, no culture is as advanced in farming as the English are right now. So if you send me to England, I can get this great understanding of their practices, their techniques, and I can bring it back to the United States and really help uh, the area prosper. And so this is a picture of that Staten Island farm that he worked at. And so his father agrees, as he always does with Olmsted, and uh, Frederick goes across to England. Um, and, you know, while he went there with an idea to look at farming techniques, it really was never in his idea because his first stop is in Liverpool. Um, and really the first place they stop is Birkenhead Park. And he goes to Birkenhead Park and he kind of is completely shocked by what he sees. He can't believe that, you know, a community would set aside this land that there could be a profit made off of, set it aside just for the people, just for their enjoyment. He makes a comment that the King of England or the lowest of peasants could have been, you know, are all enjoying this park. And it's something that doesn't happen in America because the America Olmsted's coming from if you aren't a wealthy landowner, your only option for open green spaces are cemeteries. So that was where a lot of the recreation happened during Olmsted's childhood and prior to his life as a landscape architect. And so he's really blown away by these by this park that's for the people. And what he's also blown away with is the English pasture. So you can see in that bottom page, uh, the bottom picture, he's kind of shocked that they leave so much land alone and just kind of let it cultivate, let it be, let it kind of thrive on its own. And it's something that doesn't happen or he doesn't see happening in America. And he also feels like, you know, this pasture view, it's something that, you know, Americans could really benefit from. Could really, you know, he's kind of realizing that, you know, mental, excuse me, physical health and mental health are one in one with each other. And these open green spaces where people can both passive and actively recreate are incredibly important for him. So when Olmsted returns home from England, while he does still own the farm, he's kind of pretty much done with it. Um, he would, you distracted me a little, sorry. <laughs> he would, um, you know, he wasn't really feeling the farm. So he decides to uh, take all of his writings. He'd been sending home letters to his friends and family. And he decides to compile all these letters into a book, which becomes Walks and Talks of an American Farmer in England. So Olmsted now has really become known as a writer. He's not yet a landscape architect. You know, he starts as a farmer and he kind of moves his way into writing. And so Olmsted, uh, you know, he now is a popular writer and, uh, you know, John Hull and Charles Loring Brace, they are still close friends. The three of them are always talking about politics and the economy, particularly about the issue of slavery down South. 
uh, Charles Loring Brace is a staunch abolitionist, while Frederick Law Olmsted, he's really unsure where he stands because he doesn't want to base his thoughts off of other people's writings. You know, there are plenty of writings coming from the South into the North about what treatment was like, but he wasn't really sure if he trusted that. He really wanted to get his own view. Um, so in, excuse me, in 1852, he begins his Southern travels. So Olmsted would travel from uh, Washington down to Alabama and then across to Texas. And so uh, he's really shocked by what he sees. He kind of feels that, you know, the North isn't really getting a true picture of what is happening. He kind of feels like the economy of the South is kind of being strained by the slavery. Um, and so he decides to write his next book, which would be The Cotton Kingdom. Um, and so that would be two books that would be combined into one. Uh, it actually was read by Malcolm X while he was imprisoned. And so the Southern travels were incredibly important for him to kind of realize his social value, kind of realize, you know, I can't just sit back on the sidelines. I need, if something is wrong, I need to say something. So he compiles these writings. And I will say the writings uh, were all published originally in the New York, in what would become the New York Times. Um, these writings would actually help the Times become a credible source for all, uh, for kind of just in, uh, putting in facts and not uh, opinions. And so the highlight of this trip was the leg that he did in Texas. He brings his brother, John Hall, with him because at the time, John is suffering from tuberculosis and there is no cure, really. The only treatment is open air, recreation, being outside. Uh, the brothers have an amazing time after a rather kind of depressing uh, portion of the South. Uh, they meet these German immigrants in Texas who are fighting for abolition. They've got this newspaper that, you know, they're kind of being attacked for because you're in the South, you can't be pro, uh, you can't be pro-abolitionist. Um, and so when Olmsted returns North, he actually uh, convinces a number of his wealthy friends to fund the newspaper so it can stay in, uh, intact. And so Olmsted is still a strong writer. Um, unfortunately, uh, in 1857, uh, the same year that work in Central Park begins, his brother John dies. He succumbs to his tuberculosis. In one final letter to his brother, and I will say the brothers, they're really each other's best friends, almost the love of each other's lives. Uh, John writes to Frederick, don't let Mary suffer while you're alive. So in one final act for his brother, Frederick would marry his brother's widow, also named Mary, and raise his children as his own. So John Charles Olmsted, who we will touch on a little bit later when we move to the legacy of Olmsted, um, he is really Olmsted's nephew turned stepson, really being raised as his natural son. Um, so in 1857, work on Central Park would begin really with a competition, a design competition. Uh, Olmsted had actually already been hired as the superintendent of the grounds. And what that meant is he doesn't touch a single rock. He doesn't move a single tree. He's really just tasked with walking on the ground day and night learning the topography, learning the curvature of the grounds, learning basically kind of, he knows the landscape like the back of his hand. So when the Central Park design competition opens, Olmsted initially doesn't want to enter. His boss is entering, so he kind of doesn't want to step on anyone's toes. Uh, but his boss, Egbert Bile, is kind of like, there's no chance you're going to win, so why don't you just enter? Um, and still, he didn't really want to enter, uh, but English architect Calvert Vox does want to enter. And he is kind of scratching his head because he, like everybody else, is designing blind. They don't know what the land looks like. All they know is that it's going to be in a rectangle. Except for one man, because he's been tasked to walk on the grounds day and night, and that is Frederick Law Olmsted. So Vox decides or convinces Olmsted to partner with him on Central Park. Uh, they create their design. They were actually uh, about five hours late to submit. So they go to the office where it's submitted. It's locked. They're kind of trying to open the door. It's not budging. They see a janitor in there. They get his attention and they're kind of like, hey, can you can you put this in there with the rest? And he's like, oh, but can you put it can you put it in the middle of the stack? So it looks like, you know, it's been there the whole time. Um, so a little bit of trickery, but it ended up working because uh, Olmsted and Vox would get the commission for Central Park and begin their design. And so Olmsted was always a little bit upset that the park was in a rectangle, this perfect rectangle, because where in nature do you find a perfect rectangle? Um, but, you know, he had to deal with what he dealt with, what he was given. And so Olmsted, in most of his designs, he really does design for the plot of land he's given. He's really not thinking about the price or the cost. Um, and this was a particular issue in New York. Uh, 
because Andrew Haskell Green, who is in charge of all the finances at Central Park, he's constantly telling Olmstead, no, like we can't afford this or we can't do that. You know, it's just getting to be too much. And this is really the first time Olmstead is told no money wise because he had never, you know, his father had given him everything he wanted. So he was really kind of unsure what to do with being told no. Um, so work on Central Park continues. However, while work on Central Park continues, uh, the Civil War breaks out, which would stop all work on Central Park. And Olmsted really wanted to find a way to serve his country, but he had injured uh, his leg actually in an accident at Central Park. He had hurt his leg. His leg was about two, one leg was two inches shorter than the other. So he's deemed unfit for service, um, but he still wants to help his country somehow. And so he makes a trip to a Union encampment, and he is really shocked by what he sees. There are soldiers uh, resting next to where they're eating, next to where they're doing their business. There's really no separation of sanitation. And he's realizing that more soldiers are dying off the battlefield because of these unsanitary conditions than on the battlefield. So Olmsted realizes, you know, this is what I can do. This is how I can help. So in 1862, with the permission of President Lincoln, he forms, he helps form the United States Sanitary Commission. And so the Sanitary Commission would have a couple really important roles in the Civil War. Uh, the first was the distribution of goods. Uh, what was happening at the time was uh, states were kind of a little statist in that, you know, Massachusetts families, they wanted to send goods and services down but they only wanted those goods and services to go to Massachusetts troops. The same with Ohio, you know, all these states, they only wanted their resources going to the boys from their state. And what Olmsted realizes is that, you know, these perishable goods, they go past soldiers that actually need them. And by the time they get to their intended target, uh, they, they're unusable. And so what the United States Sanitary Commission would do, they would pool all of these resources, this food, this medical equipment, these blankets, and they would distribute them evenly to all troops, ensuring that everyone got a fair share of the uh, resources. Uh, the second and perhaps most important part of Olmsted's work in the Civil War were his floating hospitals. Um, so there were several boats, shipping liners not being used during wartime. Olmsted asked President Lincoln, you know, I want to take these boats. I want to strip them of everything. They don't need to float. And then I want to fill them with hospital beds. I want to fill them with medical supplies. I want to fill them with nurses, take them down past the Union line into the Confederacy to pick up our troops. Um, and so this work would actually be uh, the basis for the Red Cross. And so Olmsted really feels like he has finally, um, you know, he served his country properly. He's given the men and the women who served in the nurses area of the boats um, a real opportunity to serve their country. And so when he returns back, when the Civil War ends, he returns back to Central Park. But again, he's a little, you know, again, Andrew Haskell Green is telling him no money wise. He's getting upset that his design isn't being carried out exactly how he wanted it. So he decides to go to, uh, in 1863, decides to go to California for the first time in his life. So the reason he goes to California is he was convinced, perhaps by a not great friend, uh, to manage the Mariposa mining camp, a uh, mining estate, because Olm said he has gone from a sailor to a writer, and now he's kind of really this uh, kind of supervisor, superintendent. He was really good at managing all these moving parts, as he proved with the Sanitary Commission. So the Mariposa mining estate hires him. Um, he probably shouldn't have gone. By the time he gets to the estate, the mines are completely run clean. There's no profit to be made. It really isn't successful except that it's the first time he gets to go to Yosemite. Um, so this is a trip from his Yosemite. Uh, he is the bottom left second in. Uh, so there's a little bit of a hat sitting next to him. Um, and Olmsted is completely blown away by what he sees. He has never seen trees grow so tall. He's never seen rock faces extend so vertically into the air. He really is shocked. And he's realizing, you know, Yosemite is being logged 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There is no protection in the land. And he's realizing, you know, if we don't do something, this area is going to be taken. No one is going to be able to enjoy it. And he's kind of realizing there's probably places all over the country just like this. These beautiful places that, you know, a landscape architect and engineer, you can't create this. This is just a naturally occurring feature. So he would write his Yosemite report, which is the first time in recorded U.S. history 
that someone would write about preserving land for the people, not for profit, and kind of keeping it that way. Um, it was a highly controversial uh, writing at the time because how could we set aside land that we could be making a profit off of? Uh, so Olmsted chooses, or excuse me, so the his Yosemite report kind of gets buried, unfortunately. Um, however, it wouldn't be a total fail because once he comes back to the United, or excuse me, once he comes back east, uh, he still wants to be this writer. He still feels like he, you know, has a good way. He's kind of got an eye for true information and not opinion. Um, so he forms the Nation magazine, which kind of allows him to write freely, write about whatever he wants, um, and also all based in fact. Um, and they have a strong section of um, horticulture and landscape architecture, which doesn't really exist at the time. I will say that uh, landscape architecture as a term didn't exist until work on Central Park was pretty much complete, uh, at least for Olmsted and Vox's work. Um, he was originally called a gardener, which Olmsted hated because, you know, he kind of looks his gardeners as these perfectly straight lines and these beautifully manicured flowers. Um, he kind of sees architect, you know, that's a little bit too, you know, structurally buildings. Um, and landscape architect, which Vox actually terms, which is the perfect word for what they do. Um, kind of this idea that, you know, we don't touch anything. We kind of just ensure that it's preserved and ensure that people have access to it. Um, so Olmsted and Vox, after they work on Central Park, they would found uh, a landscape firm together, Olmsted and Vox. They would work on the Riverside community in Chicago, as well as uh, Prospect Park in New York City, um, which they kind of felt uh, was a little bit stronger of a park than Central Park. Uh, Central Park was that perfect rectangle, whereas Prospect Park, you know, it kind of juts into the city and it kind of flows with the natural topography and scenery. And they were also really able to do uh, the work that they wanted, whereas Central Park, they were often told not to do certain work, but at Prospect Park, the city kind of Brooklyn, which was a separate city from New York at the time, they were like, we see the success of Central Park, so whatever you want to do, we'll take care of it. Um, so very generous of them. And so in 1874, uh, Olmsted would begin the work on the Capitol building, uh, really the Capitol building and the Capitol grounds Essentially, he, as well as his uh, sons, would help work on uh, really designing the Capitol. It's the Macmillan plan, kind of reinventing the Capitol area, bringing in new green spaces. And so in 1883, uh, he would make his move to Brookline, Massachusetts. Um, he had been kind of traveling back and forth because work on the Boston Park system was just now beginning. And so he's traveling back and forth um, and he's often staying at uh, local architect Henry Hobson Richardson's home, which is just a couple of houses down the road from where uh, he would end up settling. And so he's, he's often staying at Richardson's. And as the story goes, he wakes up on a snowy morning. He looks outside and he sees the plows already at work removing snow. And he declares, this is a civilized community. I am going to live here, which is very New England. All we really need are some snow plows to feel like we've, you know, are civilized. And so the move to Brookline would really allow Olmsted to really flourish in Boston. Uh, Boston really gave Olmsted and the greater Boston area would really give Olmsted the opportunity to do any work that he wanted. You know, they had seen the success of Central Park. They had seen the success of Riverside. They had seen the success really all over the country. And Olmsted really, excuse me, Boston really feels like, you know, we want to progress as a city. We want to be kind of this epicenter of greenery. So they hire Olmsted and they pretty much allow him to do whatever he wants. Um, so Franklin Park is already established, or excuse me, he helps acquire the land for Franklin Park. The Arnold Arboretum has already been established. He's kind of realizing there are these little parks kind of scattered around Boston, but they're not connected. And he realizes that, you know, if we can connect them, we can create this linear park. You know, people will never have to leave the park to travel the city. Um, and so that is something that he would replicate in Buffalo. He would replicate, which I will say, I believe Buffalo was actually the first linear city. Uh, his sons would replicate in Seattle. So it's this idea that kind of the lungs of the city, that the parks are really the heart of the city and you shouldn't have to travel far to get to a park. It really should just be in your backyard. Um, so perhaps, uh, so towards the end of his life, so 1883, uh, in about 10 years, uh, his work would kind of start dying down a little for him. 
Um, but his last kind of major projects are the Chicago World's Fair, which is the left-hand picture, and the Biltmore Estate, which is the bottom right picture. Um, and both of these, you know, there was a little bit of disagreement on all of them. Uh, he didn't particularly like the idea of the White City. Uh, he didn't think it would fit well in his design. He was a little stressed for time at the Chicago World's Fair also. I think on opening day, they had only done about half of their plantings. Um, and at the Biltmore, uh, he actually was given a lot of freedom. Um, he would end up working to, you know, the house was oriented in one direction. And Olmsted was like, you know, I think you can get the best views if you kind of reorient it. Olmsted's always realizing, even in these architecture pieces where the house is really the main feature and the landscape is there to complement. Olmsted really feels like wherever you're standing in this house, I want to ensure that you are going to get the best view of the surrounding landscapes. And so both of these projects are uh, interesting projects because they are the projects that Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. would work on with him, his true born son. Um, so in 1870, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. is born. He's actually born Harry Perkins. Um, Olmsted had several children pass in infancy. And perhaps because of this, he was a little concerned that then Harry Perkins wouldn't make it to adulthood. So they named him Harry, but for the first four years of his life, they just called him boy because they were so afraid of growing an attachment to him that they didn't really want to call him his name and then lose him. Uh, when he reaches four, they realize he is going to make it to adulthood. Um, so they rechristen him Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. And from his birth, uh, Olmsted Jr. really doesn't have a choice in what he is going to do. His father pretty much spent the early years of his life preparing him for to take over uh, work at the firm. He would take him on trips with him and the Biltmore and World's Fair would be his first project. So not a bad project to start on. Uh, there's a great story that Junior asks his father, you know, why am I not getting paid for this work? And Senior's like, well, I don't want anyone to think that you got this job just because of me, even though he so clearly did get the job just because of him. Um, and so Olmsted would work until around 1900 when his health begins to fail him. He uh, can't really hold himself up physically. He's not all there mentally. Um, so his wife, Mary, makes the decision to take him out of the home of Brookline and take him to their home in Deer Isle, Maine, called Felsted. Uh, they stay there for about a year, year and a half. Uh, Mary, it's just too much for Mary. Olmsted, you know, needs real help. Uh, he needs to, you know, proper med medical care. And so Mary makes the very tough decision to put uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. at McLean Institute in Belmont, Massachusetts. And so Olmsted had actually designed the grounds of McLean years before he had arrived, years before he would be a patient there. And so he gets, he arrives in McLean. He's not all there physically. He's certainly not all there mentally, but he looks around and he says, they didn't follow my plans, confound them. Uh, which is, again, his very own said he always knows what he had intended and what actually was carried out. Um, in the mental institute designs, he was very particular about it kind of being like a, almost like a community. He didn't want it to have this hospital feel, and he really wanted to emphasize greenery. You know, he felt like rec passive active recreation, just being outside was incredibly important for him. Um, so unfortunately, Frederick Law Olmsted Sr. would pass in 1903. However, his legacy would continue on as his son, John Charles, and Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. would carry on the Olmsted name. Uh, the firm would last until the 1980s. Uh, obviously, the junior, junior and John Charles would pass uh, around the 40s, but uh, the firm stayed active until the 1980s, working on sites all across the country and all across the world. They've got designs in Canada, Cuba, Haiti, Venezuela, Thailand. Um, and his sons would really carry on this idea of the parks are for the people. Whatever you wanna do in a park, as long as you're not harming the landscape or harming others, the parks are really here for you. And so in 1913, uh, perhaps after reading his father's or uh, Yosemite report, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. sits down here at 99 Warren Street in Brookline to write his Organic Act. And so that is the actual piece of legislature that would set aside parks for all time and create this organizing unit to manage it. So Acadia, Everglades, Yosemite, Great Smoky Mountains, Rock Creek Park, the Olmsteads had a hand in all of these national park designs and preservation. But with the Organic Act, Jr. was able to take the ideas of his father 
about preserving and conserving land for all time, it being for all people, regardless of race, social class, gender, religion, ethnicity, anything, and take it from the site in Brookline and spread it to the, I think we're at 400, 420 national park sites across our country. Um, so the Olmstead firm would have a serious impact all across the country, totaling 6,000 designs, it says nationwide, but really worldwide, um, with about a third of those designs here in Massachusetts alone. So estates, colleges, subdivision community, parks, pretty much every green space has an Olmsted tie. And we like to say that every landscape architect has about a three degree separation from Olmsted because the firm, you know, it really was the first landscape architecture school in the country. Uh, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. would go on to help found the landscape architecture school at Harvard. But really this is where you got the training. Uh, men and women, they came in, they got their training and then you know, years later, they would go and form their own practice. And that never upset Olmsted. In a way, it kind of made him proud. He felt like, I've taught you everything you need to know. You're going to go out, you know, you're going to respect the scenery, the natural characteristics, the topography. Um, so he really didn't feel like it was taking business from him. He really felt like it was just kind of broadening his reach and his ideas. Um, so 6,000 designs worldwide, 2,000 plus in Massachusetts. Unfortunately, not that many in Tewksbury, though. Um, so we kind of have some hotbeds in Lowell and Andover. Um, and I will say, uh, if you Google Olmsted Worldview, uh, you'll get to this page, a much bigger version of this page, and you can plug in anywhere in the world. It will zoom you in and it will start populating your map with Olmsted designs. So the light purple dots are estates, the green are parks, the orange are colleges. I think the reds are... Uh, public buildings. Um, so you would be absolutely surprised to find that you live right next to an Olmsted design landscape. Uh, I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts. I didn't know that Olmsted existed until I got this job. And, you know, you'd be surprised. You'll find them pretty much everywhere. Newton Cemetery, Newton Center Playground, Newton City Hall, Oak Hill Park, uh, just for my Newton. I did think I'd heard some Newton people on the call. Um, and so touching really quickly on some design practices of Olmsted, um, so this picture here is of Fair is here at Fairstead, 99 Warren Street, um, and this is our rock garden. And so the first design feature I want to talk about is curved lines versus straight lines. So Olmsted, as much as he could help it, he will never put a straight line in his park. You know, he was furious about that Central Park Square. That's why there's so many curving lines through those parks. And his reasoning behind that is he really wants to make people struggle to get out of the park. He doesn't want it to be easy. Um, so while this path, the, the image here kind of looks like it can go on for miles and miles, uh, once you make that turn, that's pretty much the end of the path. Uh, we like to call it the shortest hiking trail in the National Park Service. And so it's this idea of he really wants people to get lost in the landscape. He kind of, he's screening the outside world. He wants it to make it seem like, you know, you really have left the worries and troubles of your life behind and you can now kind of just be in nature and think. Uh, the uh, the reason, or I will say, uh, he will include straight lines. So this is in nearby Andover at Phillips Academy. Kind of see in the left uh, corner, there's a lot of straight lines going through the campus. And so he will only include straight lines at colleges and schools. And his reasoning behind that are that college kids, you know, they'll always find time to kind of stop and smell the roses, enjoy themselves. But you give the working class an A to B shot, they will take that shot. They will not stop and look around. So he kind of feels like the curved lines are for the children and the young adults and the straight, excuse me, the straight lines are for the children and the young adults, while the curved lines are uh, to kind of force these adults to almost remember what it was like to be a child. Olmsted also had this idea of a borrowed view. Um, so right at the bottom of this picture, there is a stone wall. Um, so that is the edge of our property. This picture is also here at Fairstead. And so Olmsted had this idea of a borrowed view. So the neighboring property actually belongs or did belong to Isabella Stewart Gardner. It was her summer estate. And so Olmsted could obviously not touch the land that he didn't own. Uh, but what he could do is manipulate his own land to kind of give an optical illusion that his landscape is bigger than it is. So there really is a thick screen of trees between our property and the Gardner estate. However, Olmsted chose to give a little window by taking out a couple of those trees. 
to kind of give this optical illusion that his property goes on for miles and miles, even though we are just under two acres. Um, so another Olmsted design feature, curved lines, particularly in city design. Um, so the most popular uh, and most commonly used uh, city design is just to plop a grid right down on wherever you are, uh, which would never work on topogra varied topography. Like here in Brookline, there's such varied topography that you couldn't just put a grid down. It wouldn't work. Um, so he really includes these curving lines through his subdivisions and his communities. And he also does this to ensure to kind of block outside traffic. Um, so this community, uh, Corey, or excuse me, Fisher Hill in Brookline, uh, which is Olmsted's most intact subdivision in the country today. Um, so it is bookended by Brookline, or excuse me, by Beacon and Boylston Street. And what he does is he only has one road connecting the two and he ensures that it's on the edge of the subdivision. So in all subdivisions, he doesn't want this to be a shortcut where people can just kind of all this traffic comes into the area and kind of ruins the streets. He really wants the streets to be for the community um, and not, you know, have this outside traffic entering in. Um, and so always kind of the previous, all of his experiences in life really play into how he would design. And so this image is from Franklin Park here in Boston. Um, and kind of going back to his England trip when he saw these massive pastures and this left alone land, he really wanted to replicate that here in Boston. Um, so Franklin Park really was meant to be this pastured landscape, kind of mimic that English pasture. Um, unfortunately, with many Olmsted designs, he kind of has to understand that, you know, time develops, people people's interests change. Um, so he would perhaps shouldn't have, but he would approve the first game of golf in Franklin Park, kind of hoping that it wasn't going to catch fire and that it would just be a one-time thing. Unfortunately, golf, or fortunately for him, uh, golf became such a popular sport that he really wasn't able to um, to kind of stop the development of the golf course in Franklin Park, which he always was upset about. And his sons, you know, really pushed for it not to be developed. Um, but many Olmsted designs, you know, they have to adapt with time. They have to evolve with time. And so, you know, some are lost in history. Uh, there's one park that is now under a runway at Boston Logan Airport. Um, so he's kind of aware that these designs, they will get lost in time. And so that is all I have for my presentation, but I will say, I'm just gonna stop sharing and then we can move to the chat or the questions, excuse me. But I will say, so uh, Frederick Olmsted National Historic Site, uh, we have several, oh, I think that just went to the panelists, excuse me, everybody. So we try and do as many events as we can throughout the city, knowing that not everyone is going to be able to make it to Frederick Olmsted National Historic Site. Um, so last year, you know, we did a walk downtown in Back Bay. Uh, we've got a couple of walks this uh, coming up. So if you are interested in that, I just sent the link. You can check them out. You can register. I will say that uh, we are closed as of right now, but on April, excuse me, April 28th, uh, we will reopen to the public on Fridays and Saturdays. So if you're more than welcome, you know, if you're able to come to the site, we're always happy to have you. I will also drop my email because if you can't make it on those Fridays and Saturdays, uh, we are more than happy to just, if you have a group coming, we can schedule a tour. Um, let me remember that. We're more than happy to schedule a tour that you can uh, use. Um, so now I'm going to jump into the Q&A, if that's all right, Robert, to try and go to the top. What was That's, the Boston? Yeah, so Isabel, would you like me to read you the questions or do you want to read them yourselves? It's up to you. Uh, I can read them. I think I got them all. Sounds um, good. So you got 18 right now. So what was the Boston Park project called? Lace something. So it's called the Emerald Necklace. Um, I will say that Frederick Law Olmsted actually originally wanted to call it the Jeweled Girdle, uh, which we're very lucky that someone convinced him not to change it. Um, so yes, the Emerald Necklace. Uh, bah, bah, people's attitudes. Did Flo have any contact with Thoreau and Darwin? So Olmsted wasn't, um, you know, he would not be in contact with Thoreau and Darwin. He was very influenced by the transcendentalist movement um, and particularly his sons were, but he would not uh, have any uh, notation with them. They kind of, um, how do I want to say this? Uh, he always got his learning from reading. So even, uh, 
Ralph Waldo Emerson, who lived in, um, who actually lived in Franklin Park for some time, uh, they would never kind of cross paths. So he never was really, you know, he never really met with any of these people, even Isabella Stewart Gardner, who's right next door. There was no conversation with them. Um, so yeah, he kind of, everything he learned, he really learned from books, but he, if you weren't a landscape architect, an architect or a client, he really wasn't um, giving any answers or time for you. Um, so who coined the next emerald necklace term and when? So I believe the necklace term was coined, I wanna say in the late 1880s. Um, I don't believe anyone is credited with coining it. I think they, you know, the jeweled girdle obviously wasn't the greatest term to use. Um, and so I, they kind of, I think it was a combination of Boston City Park Commissioners um, who helped work for it. Uh, what is the best book describing Olmsted's legacy? Yeah, so there are a ton of books on Olmsted. I think the easiest to read is uh, Justin Martin's Genius of Place. Um, that is a great Sorry, I'm getting a call from my boss. I'm going to hang up though. Um, uh, so that is a really great book to jump into. There are, um, you know, the Olmsted papers, which are pretty much all of his writings. That would be a little bit later. I do, you know, I have trouble reading Olmsted. He has, you know, I don't know if they just didn't use commas then, but lots of books, or excuse me, lots of run on sentences, which was very uh, difficult. Um, have you an update on efforts of Boston to restore? So there are lots of efforts to restore uh, Olmsted design parks, not just in Boston, but all over the country. Uh, particularly, uh, the best example I can think of is the Back Bay Fens, which Olmsted's design was pretty much obsolete two years after he had created the design. Um, you know, Olms Boston was a seriously polluted city. Uh, the tides would bring trash in, take it out to sea. It's actually said you could smell Boston before you could see it. Um, so there are work, I, if you're interested in updating work, uh, the American Society of Landscape Architects, they have a lot of great work, as well as uh, the Cultural Landscape Foundation has a lot of um, little information on parks. And then you can um, go from there into other, uh, kind of see how it developed into the future. So why did the Olmsted firm end in the 1980s? That is a great question. Um, so the Olmsted firm would go from Olmsted and Vox to Olmsted, Olmsted Elliott, to Olmsted Brothers, which is kind of where the Olmsted name would be left. Um, so when Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. dies, uh, the, last, uh, the last person who had worked with him was... Um, working at the site and sorry, I'm blanking on his name right now, but he's working at the site and he's kind of realizing that this is an incredibly expensive place to maintain. Uh, you know, they're not getting really a lot of business, but they kind of, you know, he, the man kind of realized, you know, there's so much history at this site. It would be an absolute shame to let it fall into private hands. Um, so it's something Richardson, oh, Artemis Richardson. So Artemis Richardson is the last one working here. And he has a couple of designs that he wants to work on, but he gets a number of requests uh, not to buy the home, but just to buy the Olmsted name because of the magnitude behind it. And he kind of realizes there's so much history here. So much of the park service history is here. So he really works to convince um, the park service to acquire the site, which originally they really weren't interested in acquiring. They kind of saw this as a paper-based site there are over 1 million pieces of paper stored here. So they kind of felt like, you know, I don't think we're the right people for this design, um, but eventually it would, uh, they would be approved and the park service would acquire the site. Um, so from Richard, are, are Olmsted principles being reassessed? Is there a movement in urban park design away from Olmsted? Yeah, so I think, like I said, all of landscape architects kind of have this kind of link to Olmsted. I think they're kind of realizing that, you know, more so they really need to adapt to the times. So Olmsted was very aware of, you know, that areas are going to be, you know, he kind of had kind of a sixth sense knowing that population was going to boom. Um, 
but really um, Olmsted's principles, even if you go to a park and it's not Olmsted design, you are going to be able to see those Olmsted features um, just because it's such a prevalent part of all landscape architecture. Um, so, but definitely assess, I think, you know, like Olmsted Senior uh, hated any architecture on his parks, any stature, any statues, any sculptures. And we're kind of realizing that, you know, art is part of the parks and that's a great way to see parks. You know, Olmsted kind of felt like it was a bit of a distraction, a deterrence, um, but really it's kind of just another way to immerse yourself in the park and find new histories of the park. So how can we access the list of Olmsted projects around the world? Yes, I can type that into the chat. Um, just kidding, I can't open the chat. Oh, there we go. So if you just Google Olmsted World View, um, the first link is going to be to the Park Service site. And it was, um, and so yeah, it'll take you to our website and then you'll scroll down to a little link. Um, and it really is, it's an absolutely amazing resource, historical images, historical photos, uh, plans. Um, it really is just, I, I spend most of my time on that website just because it's so fun to kind of have a look into the past. Um, so what did Olmsted think of Capability Brown? He was, he read Capability Brown often. Um, he was another one of his influences, another one of um, kind of the people, uh, excuse me, kind of another one of those people that he read, never got to meet, but got to really immerse himself in the writing. Um, and so his legacy, you know, we, so we store all of these designs from all 6,000 projects. About once a month, we get a request from a local call or not even local, a college, an estate, a hospital, a community saying, you know, we have this Olmsted landscape. It's taken degradation over the years. We'd love to look at that original plan. Um, so one example of this is Syracuse University has a garden that was designed by the Olmsted brothers. It took a lot of abuse over time, um, you know, really wasn't doing well. And so the university reached out to us, asked for the original plans. And what they found is that a lot of the original design wasn't carried out uh, because just like his father, the two sons, they also designed just for the plot of land they were given, not really with the, um, not really with a price in mind. So Syracuse was like, this is a great plan. We can't afford this. We're not going to do that. Um, and so the university reached out and not only were they able to upgrade the garden, they were really able to bring it back or bring it to the first time to its real Olmsted um, design. And are modern landscape designers carrying his ideas forward? Yes, absolutely. There are landscape architects who really work only on Olmsted design landscapes to modernize them, to update them, but always keeping the Olmsted idea in mind. It's really this idea of, you know, you shouldn't be able to see any landscape architecture's work. And perhaps that's why he didn't like the statues and sculptures. He really wanted you to feel, even in parks in the middle of cities, he wanted you to feel like you could just, you know, be at one and just, you know, kind of lose yourself and not realize that this is a park or this is a designed area. Are all the spaces he worked on in Newton identified with plaques? No, so Olmsted's work is really hardly ever uh, kind of noted that it is there. Um, you know, he kind of wants that back seat. He doesn't want a plaque saying that he worked on this. You know, some like some conservancies, um, so the Emerald Necklace Conservancy, they have a couple of uh, panels in the park. I know the Rochester Olmsted Conservancy, the Buffalo Olmsted Conservancy, they all have these kind of informational panels, but Olmsted would never want that single credit just for him. Um, he would really appreciate, um, excuse me, he would really just want the landscape to shine and not have any distractions. So as much as he could help it, he wouldn't put his name on it. Um, are there any living Olmsted descendants? So there are uh, several Olmsted living descendants. We actually had, uh, I, I believe it was Frederick Olmsted Jr.'s descendants actually came to our site and got a tour. None of them have stayed um, in landscape arc, or excuse me, none of them stayed in landscape architecture, um, but they definitely are, you know, happy with that name and kind of always interested in learning the history of their family. Um, so yes, uh, was it unusual at the time to permit women to study landscape architecture? It was, and it, you know, I should say that during Olmsted Senior's time, 
Uh, there were not women in the office working as landscape architects. They worked in the clerical wing. Um, and so the men of the office did not give the women of the office at the time the respect they deserve. Uh, but we give it to them on every tour because nothing that happens in the entire office happens without the woman in the uh, clerical wing. They handle every request sent to the firm, every bill is sent to the firm. They keep the Olmsted senior, junior, and John Charles up to date. While it would have been very hard for a firm member to go from you know, the engineering department to the planting department, it did happen eventually or sometimes. Uh, but if invited, the woman of the clerical wing really could have fit in anywhere upstairs or in the office because they were so versed in the entire Olmsted story and the entire design process. Um, so some woman, so Marianne, I'm gonna mispronounce her name, Mariana Van Rensselaer Griswold was a very famous uh, landscape critic. Um, and you know, I, she came to the site to hear it fair said, and she was a little unimpressed with Olmsted's design of the area. Um, you know, his daughter, Marion, she is uncredited, but she took a number of photos and did a number of designs for the Olmsted firm. Um, so we always kind of have to look at Olmsted Sr. kind of in the time that he was working in. Um, but as the firm advanced, uh, they would continue working or they would continue inviting women in. And um, Frederick Olmsted Jr. would be very influential in finding an all um an all-female uh, landscape architecture school that was uh, partnered with Harvard University. Um, so what would Olmsted think of the onslaught of climate change and the impact on and challenge to preserving the landscapes he created? <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, you know, he was always, you know, he does did have an eye towards the future, but, you know, I think he's understanding that, you know, landscapes change as the climate changes, you know, Particularly in Back Bay, I think climate was a big issue with the rising tides pushing further, further into the water or into the city. Um, you know, I think that, I think you'd be very upset with how we've taken or collectively we as a whole did work. Um, yeah. Um, so did Olmsted have a favorite among all the parks he had a hand in designing? Um, I don't think he had a favorite. I, I, I had to say it would probably be Biltmore and the World's Fair solely because that was his opportunity to work with Frederick Olmsted Jr. and really kind of push him into the business. Um, you know, he had a really good idea. So Stanford University was one that, you know, he worked really hard in the design for. And, you know, as happens in many designs, sometimes you have to um, understand that you know, your client isn't always going to want your design. Um, so we had this great design for Stanford, but uh, Leland Stanford wanted that school to rival the Ivy Leagues of the East Coast, so much so that he wanted the same plant and tree material. And Olm said, you know, it kind of has to convince him, you know, this is California, this is in New England, we got to design for the climate we're in. Um, so I wouldn't say a favorite, I think a lot, he struggled with a lot of designs just because of, um, just because he wasn't really taken so seriously or he wasn't always, his ideas weren't always accepted. Um, so so did Isabel, Olmsted... I hate to do this. Oh yeah. <laughs> you, you went through about 24 questions. I'm very impressed. Um, and we've got another 29 to go, but unfortunately I do want to hour the one hour uh, time uh, limit here. Um, now, uh, Isabel, would you mind uh, typing in your email address once again into the chat? And for the 29 people that asked questions, and there's actually more than 29 because we had some questions in the chat as well. Uh, for the folks who didn't get their questions answered live, uh, feel free to uh, email the questions to uh, Isabel. Uh, I guess it's yes, the next please. next thing. Yeah, yeah. So Isabel just provided her uh, email address into the chat. Uh, so folks, uh, we are going to uh, start to wrap up. Uh, we've got two minutes left. Uh, Isabel, I did want to ask you one question from the chat that my former uh, library school teacher asked, so I feel like I have to ask this question. Uh, could you confirm a story I heard that Olmsted introduced squirrels into Central Park so people could see wildlife in the city setting? True or false? I'm going to say true. Olmsted was very, he wanted to introduce uh, sheep to Franklin Park. He also wanted to put a hippopotamus in Olmsted Park here in Brookline. So he wants to see all of these animals kind of doing their natural habitat. So it does look, feel more like wilderness than it is a park. 
So folks, let's give Isabel uh, one last uh, virtual round of applause and feel free to let her know in the chat if you haven't already, uh, whether or not you enjoyed uh, today's program. Uh, look for an email from me later today with a link to this recording, a link to a feedback survey and information about some other upcoming uh, virtual programs with other Massachusetts National Historic Sites. Uh, and uh, in addition, I will thank all 55 or so participating libraries uh, in that email. Uh, so Isabel, thank you so, so much. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks again, Isabel. Yeah, thanks for having me. Bye everyone.